Greg. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Now I will share my screen. Please let me, let me know if it functions. Yeah. So the gradual with a shelf mark number 15, 501 of the Austrian National Library in Vienna is famous for its splendid illuminations. It is relevant for the historic and the religious identity of Bohemia, and most of all, it is an important source for the tradition of plain chant and cantus fractus in late medieval Central Europe. I want to present you some significant aspects of this gradual and show you the most interesting cantus fractus pieces. And they also raise the question, what is cantus fractus? So the use of Bohemian Gothic notation and the presence of feasts for local saints leave no doubt regarding the Bohemian origin of this manuscript. The illumination on folio one version reveals that it was that it was written for the town of Kutnahora, which is located approximately 70 kilo, kilometers east of Prague, and in the 15th century was the most important center for the extraction and production of silver. Yes. Here see the mining works uh, in the kingdom of Bohemia. There is further evidence that this book was written specifically for the St. Jacob's Church of Kutnahora. Since it contains uh, the mass uh, and a sequence for the feast Transfiguratio Domini, the year 1457 is surely the terminus post quem for the dating of this book. The illuminations have been ascribed to the so called Master Matthäus who died in 1496. This year is thus a reasonable terminus antequem, but according to the thesis of Barry Graham, based on the coat of arms with the letters W and L, this gradual was written between 1509 and 1517, when both Vladislav Jagiello and his son Ludwig were kings of Bohemia. This manuscript is usually called a cantionale, even though it doesn't contain a single canto. With regard to its content, it can be defined instead a gradual sequentiary. It is clearly divided into three parts, a creale, a gradual, and a hundred folio strong sequentiary. Twelve sequences are found almost ex exclusively in Bohemian sources. It also contains a large number of tropes. The positioning of the creale at the beginning of the book is a characteristic of Hussitic liturgical books. In fact, relics of the mass and a sequence in honor of Jan Hus are to be found in this gradual. But the relevant pages were almost completely removed during the re-Catholicization of Bohemia in the 17th century. However, an illumination still uh, displays the Hussitic communion with both the Eucharistic bread and cup. Yeah, on the right. This gradual does not contain the repertory for the entire liturgical year, but only some solemnities. For example, Epiphany is immediately followed by Easter, and only 19 feasts of saints are to be found. In addition, the ordinary of the Mass is not complete for every feast. The gradual was probably sung in the Czech language. For some feasts, there are two or more alternative pieces. The reason behind the uncommon uh, uh, repertoire is that this book contains only the music sung by a community of so-called literati. Laymen and wealthy people who took care of the church music. They commissioned this gradual and sung during the liturgy. Reaching many peculiarities, this gradual holds, also has cantus fractus and two part credo settings. I'd like to point out that um, three other graduals from Bohemia dating at the end of the 15th century are preserved in the Austrian National Library, but they don't contain any cantus fractus. The cantus fractus in this source number at least 15, perhaps even 17 pieces. No one of them indicates the mensura. They are characterized by the following aspects indicated by the check marks. 
they present interventions realized after the original reduction of the manuscript, that is, the caude, or strokes, or stems, as you prefer to call them, has been added later. Only a few of them use proper notational signs with rhythmic meaning, as for example, ligatures. I consider the double notes separately, which I will explain later. Some of them have a binary rhythm, some others a ternary rhythm, but in some cases, only a few notes have been rhythmized, so that it's unclear which kind of rhythm is intended. As in the Santus in the previous picture, you can see here, only in cadenza there are some strokes. Moreover, I'd like to point out that one sanctus and one credo share the same cantus fractus melody. Four credo settings has a shortened text ending with the words at homo factus est or cuius regni non erit finis. The repertoire is partly made up of regional and partly of international melodies. In the catalog of Miatka, the credo on folio 56 recto has correspondences only in Bohemian sources. On the other hand, for the two-part credo settings, there are correspondences in manuscripts from Austria, Germany, Poland, Slovakia, and of course, Bohemian too. In eight cases, the cantus fractus is related to tropes. In this picture, you can better observe the connection of the, of the cantus fractus with the tropes. The melody of the Kyrie is in plain chant, but the melody of the trope has been rhythmized. And we saw something similar in the presentation of Jan yesterday. Regarding to the strokes, they are added because the color of the ink is brownish and, and not black. Moreover, they aren't treated with the same accuracy as the text in the Bohemian Gothic notation. I think it is completely reasonable to assume that the strokes were added not longer after the reduction of the book, but they certainly weren't written by the same scribe who wrote the Bohemian notation. The adaptation of the Planchant's uh, neumes is certainly the most tricking phenomenon concerning the Cantus Fractus in this book. In this picture, you can see an example of a great number of what I previously called double notes or double lozenges or rhombi or diamonds, as you prefer. And we saw something like that also in the uh, presentation of Alan yesterday to note neumes which could be a bistrofa in pneumatic notation or to semi-briefs in semi-mensural notation. And speaking of notation, we can distinguish between three groups of notational signs in this manuscript. Firstly, those originally designed to convey a rhythm meaning, including different types of ligatures and a square shape, which of course represents the gravis. Please observe that uh, the square notes don't belong to Bohemian Gothic notation. Neither the longa nor the dot are to be found in this book. Secondly, there is a group of signs written in their usual form as if they were intended for the plain chant. The shape of the punctum of the, of the Bohemian Gothic notation, which is a lozenge, is nat naturally suitable for representing a semi brevis. Then we can find pes, clevis, canticus, cephalicus, and bistrophe, or two lozenges written as conjoined. The third category consists of signs that have been adapted to the semi mensural notation of Cantus Fractus. They were modified in order to convey a rhythmic value in general, or a shorter rhythmic value for example, from semi brevis to minima. Adding a cauda to a punctum, or in other words, adding a stroke, a steam to a lozenge, is the most frequent phenomenon. In the same way, cauda have been added to many other neumes, as we will see. 
because of the overlapping and just a position of all these elements, it is often necessary to interpret this kind of semi-mensural notation with a certain flexibility in mind. Now, I will present you some Cantus Fractus pieces from this gradual. I'd like to begin with the Sanctus Tropum Folio 44 Recto. The melody of the Sanctus consists of six repetitions of the same phrase. The trope is trophic and uses the same melodic phrase of the Sanctus. A small difference is the repetition of a D marked in green. The notation of the trope is clearly rhythmic. In the melody of the Sanctus, some double notes are visible, as here, here, here. But I think that they should be interpreted as bistrophe or repeated notes. In this case, I think it is possible to have both a binary and a ternary interpretation of rhythm, even though I lean towards a ternary interpretation. On the word magnificat, we can apply the rule similis ante similum perfecta, and it seems logical that a double lozenge should have the value of two semibrevis. The last brevis should be double that long, of course, in the transcription, but I think it's reasonable to transcribe it as a half note with a fermata. In all the examples, I respect the original medieval spelling of the transcription of the, of the text. So if you see sometimes something not regular, it's because it's the reading of the manuscript. The credo on folio 55 recto has a trope marked in green. Resurrexit tertia die clara virtute. At the end of every verse or hemistic, a brevis is notated. We can see two descending cum opposita ligatures. Now, imagining we have in front of us the first version without strokes, it's evident that in some places the positioning of the notes seems to suggest a kind of grouping, or better, to transmit intuitively an idea of rhythmic value that, that are the places marked in green, uh, pardon, in yellow. At some points marked in blue, the notes aren't written together as it would usually be done in plain chant. So that the, it was meant to be sung rhythmically even before summer added the caude. In this credo, this is my transcription, five phrases are repeated, identical, or have a rhythmic variation by which the melody is adapted to the text. And we saw something similar in the presentation of Lenka yesterday. I made a transcription that shows the formal structure. In order to respect the original, I transcribed the brevis with a whole note, but I am pretty convinced that they should be sung as a half note with a fermata and perhaps a shorter brief breather. Um, in some points, I added, uh, sorry, I added ne neither a time signature nor bar lines, but this melody has a regular tactus of two half notes. For transcription in modern notation, some rests must be added. I can show you here in the middle there are some over here. Um, but I would rather prefer to sing some quarter notes as upbeat. In four cases, I have corrected the, no the value of a note. The original one is written above. So there is one at the end here. Here, for example. Also, little corrections. As in the previous example, the credo on folio 56 recto has a trope marked in green, Dominum Nostrum Jesu Christum. And here too, at the end of every verse or hemistic, a previous is notated. The double zenge on unigenitum, marked in yellow, is the only exception. On terre, we found a double zenge transformed into a kind of double minima. Moreover, the added caude appear frequently in group of two, four, or even twelve nodes. Thus, there is no doubt that there is a binary mensuration. 
the places marked in red are interesting. We can see, for example, normal cleavage and porectus, but also some special modified tenules. I marked these places in my transcription as well. As you can see, with a small number of editorial interventions, which are arrest and four note values, as I can show you, the rest is only here, and uh, yeah, here perhaps I change it the value of a note. This melody can fit in a tactus equivalent to two half notes. As before, the previous are transcribed with a whole note, but I think that they should be sung as a half note with a fermata. It is interesting to observe the regularity with which this melody was rhythmicized. For example, as the punctum of the Bohemian Gothic notation represents one semi brevis, a clevis represents two, and the porectus three semi brevis. The letters A and B indicate the formal structure of this credo. I'd like to show you where is. Yeah, and here. Um, uh, the melody on line two to five is repeated four times throughout the piece. Another interesting characteristic of this melody is the interval of a seventh between the end of a section and the beginning of the subsequent one. For example, within the between the first and the second line or here. Finally, I think we should consider the, the hypothesis that a second voice was, sung, was improvised on this credo which could also naturally be a topic for the closing, for the closing discussion. Here you can see the Credo I of the Vatican edition. The notation of this setting uses more signs. For example, at, at, the, <clears throat> at the ending of a verse or any stick, we can find a brevis, a double note, or double diamond if you prefer, or a bistrofa, or the sign normally used for the cephalicus, evidently used, uh, much more in the second page, evidently used <clears throat> uh, as a graphic alternative to the other one. There are the uh, ascending, uh, uh, ascendant and descendant cum opposite ligatures, and there are also groups of two minimas or a semi brevis and a minima here on the right corner. Interestingly, the frequent ligature on the notes A and B flat hasn't been modified, but often a flat sign was added at the beginning of the line. The last detail I'd like to show you is the uncommon positioning of the text under the notes marked in green. So since the notation of this credo uses more notational signs than the other settings, I was wondering how it could sound without the added strokes. So I firstly attempted a transcription of the possible previous version. In this case, notes of longer value are to be sung exclusively at the beginning and at the ending of a verse. To be honest, as a kind of declamation of the text, it seems to be convincing, but not really as a proper Cantus Fractus credo. Here you can see the transcription of the version with the caude. This time, the scribe who added the strokes worked out a better solution. Not a single note value had to be corrected. Everything fits, including, including the uncommon ligatures. Now, I'm not sure if I would edit this melody as I did here, but for now it works. The last piece I'd like to present is a two part credo setting. The second voice sings the text Credamus Patrem Onnipotentem Qui Tanto Nos Amore. You can see here. <clears throat> this is the only musical piece in this manuscript with semi minimas marked in red. Pairs of very light strokes marked in yellow have been added in order to indicate the rests. Without them, it's impossible to realize an agreeable performance of this credo. Curiously, 
The scribe who had the strokes had a predilection for groups with an uneven number of minimals. In spite of these irregularities and of some intervals of a seventh or ninth, which I corrected in my transcription, this is a nice piece of music. An impressive characteristic is the archaic style, which also has a concordance in a recently discovered fragment from the monastery of Monse in Upper Austria, dating to the second third of the 15th century. Moreover, as Charles, <coughs> as Charles Brewer wrote, its tenor became the latter basis for the choral Wir glauben all an einem Gott of Martin Luther. The manuscript 15501 of the Austrian National Library is an important witness to the tradition of Plenchant in late, medie late medieval Bohemia. And above all, it is a source of invaluable meaning for the reconstruction of the practice of performing liturgical singing in parishes where the Hussitic liturgy was practiced. The selection of the repertoire, the substantial presence of pieces with regional influences such as sequences and tropes, as well as the one and two part cantus fractus settings are all elements that reflect the great importance, the artistic vitality and the variety with which liturgical singing was still practiced in late medieval Central Europe. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your paper. Thank you. Okay. I'm trying to get out from the yeah, trying to do it. sharing to, screen. Uh, mm. There should be up as a, up, uh, a button. On the top of the screen. Right. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. I yeah. Thank you. You are back. Uh, well, I would have several questions, but I leave space first for questions from colleagues. So, so probably, yeah, if there are no. So I allow me to, to, uh, to give a few comments. Uh, uh, first, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the edition of Hannah Vrhova Werner. Uh, she published several volumes of uh, uh, tropes, and there are also tropes of uh, ordinary chant. So um, you can you can so uh, consult or compare your uh, transcriptions with uh, another solution because sometimes it's really uh, tricky to, to. Yeah, it's strictly struggling. Really and and uh, but uh, I think there is a, a, quite a, a general comment. Um, so from my experience, I would say that uh, the these chants uh, were so I now mostly credo chants were uh, distributed in a really a different way. There are so many variants, and I think it's uh, it's uh, really a problem to edit just one source. And I think it's, it's necessary to collect all possible sources and then to, uh, then there is a question whether we want to reconstruct uh, the chant in a, let's say, I know if we can say original way, but in a way which makes sense somehow, or whether we want to edit a source. And I think some sources are really, uh, uh, very problematic. So, uh, and I think here um, the, the source looks, it's beautiful, it's uh, very representative, but I think the quality of, uh, of uh, music records is, um, especially in such a beautiful manuscript, uh, quite problematic. So there are some aspects we should take uh, into, into consideration. But um, there are some questions already, yes. So we can read from the chat from Harrison. Uh, 
yeah, from Harrison, it seems that there are... Uh, oh, what was the last piece you showed? Uh, the yeah, only one with the two little one settings, uh, 52 recto and 57. Yeah, this is the, the only one with the uh, with reds. Uh, yeah. Sh should I show you? Yes, you can share the screen again. Yeah, so am I sharing the screen? Yes, yes. So, ah, no, 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 no. Ah, okay. So, yeah, this is the, the only piece with the, uh, with the rats. And I'm pretty sure that has been added later because it's, it's too, aha, uh -huh. nice. Okay, there is a problem in the, okay. So, I'm sorry if they are, the, the, yeah, they're, very small, yeah, but it's this, they are not so beautifully written as the cauda aren't. And I do agree, yeah, we should compare uh, different uh, sources in order to have a better idea of the, perhaps of the original melody, but of course we, we have to keep in mind that uh, different versions of the same melody circulated and perhaps, uh, yeah, Every, every, every book has a slightly different variant of the same melody. Yeah, yeah, there's, Hannah has a comment, if we... Okay. Yeah. So, I also wanted to share the screen later, so maybe... Uh, if yeah. We yeah, and uh, but meanwhile, I can answer the question that uh, which was also my comment. It is the um, what Lenka or Jan could say as well. This is the title Cancionale. This is something that was established uh, decades ago. Uh, why it is called the Cancionale during the time when canciones, the songs, religious songs, uh, caught the main attention. But as for the profile, it's as you said, it's regular gradual with cancionale. So we try to avoid um, any, uh, so we try to describe it as it is so gradual cancionale or Lenka, you proposed, what did you propose? Usual or specialni, uh, you proposed for this time. Mm -hmm kind of manuscript with concerning Franos, but it's gradual cancional. It's gradual with a cancional at the end, I would say. Well, I wanted to, to, uh, to, tell, to show you my, uh, to tell you my experience. There is a group of manuscripts to which this Vienna uh, Gutenberg cancionale belongs. And you might be interested to look also at inscription in, inscriptions in other manuscripts with Cantus Fractus uh, in particular. I think that one of the most representative would be the Franus Cancionale from 1505. And I found meanwhile, um, this is the wonderful thing, I can show it. Uh, you have this Angelorum Domina here in this beautifully again decorated manuscript. Mm. And you see it's in blue also already and uh, with cauda. So the rhythm was quite uh, clearly there uh, at the beginning. So it was not written sized later, but it was just uh, part of the song. And it's very, very, uh, it's, it's, it's rather um, very simple, uh, simple um, song. Uh, rather than a really a big piece of plain chant. So just this one piece. And I think this will be, again, one of our questions at the end, uh, at the final discussions, what is Cantus Fractus and what is already a normal menstrual song. Okay, so this was my comment. Thank you. Yeah, and what's, uh, what was handed down uh, orally and what was written? Because I uh, as uh, of course, there was also a kind of oral tradition. So they, they sang it, to, I guess, om, almost regularly. And uh, I'm pretty sure the 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 the, the, caudas, the strokes uh, are added not much much time later. It's, it's it's quite impossible. But at least they were not written in the same workshop in which the manuscript was written because it they uh, also this this cancionale you showed now and the the, the, the source um uh, showed um uh, jan yesterday they are so wonderfully so accurately uh, written and decorated and they are so they were so expensive to produce so it i can't believe that uh, uh, a scribe uh, wrote for the entire book a wonderful bohemic, bo bohemian gothic notation and then the strokes are not um, vertical, they are not um, 
so it's it's struggling this this aspect because the the science belongs mm -hmm. to the notation we need it for uh, more yeah, most of all for the two part <coughs> settings but perhaps they they yeah they have been added from some time later i don't know it's it's a big question as well i was puzzled but uh, looking at the original so i i at the beginning i thought okay it's just like that but then uh, looking at the original book it was evident they they are not uh, they were not written from the scribe who wrote the notation okay uh pavel has a has a question pavel gantarchik Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, lecture, for your paper. Uh, I have a question uh, bec because at the beginning you mentioned that uh, placement of Kiriale at the beginning of Gradual is a special feature of Hussite manuscripts or Bohemia manuscripts. It's really true because, because I have some uh, Graduals uh, from uh, Silesia from the first half of the 15th century. Uh, so it's maybe kind of influence or there are also other examples. Maybe I don't know another examples. Maybe Hannah knows something about this. <laughs> yeah, it's typical. It's typical that the Curiale manuscripts start with a Curiale in Bohemian context. So they are not after the mass proper they are just at the beginning yes 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 i understand but there are not not other such graduals in europe i don't know uh, any but it's interesting to to hear from you that uh, there are um, it is this this kind of uh, this characteristic is to be found also in in uh, silesia, in silesia, yes. in silesia. Yes. i have one gradual from 1416 so it's uh, rather uh, rather not uh -huh. under influence of Hussite uh, mm -hmm. liturgy, so from Wroclaw. Wroclaw 1417, is it this manuscript? 1416. 14, 14, 14, 16, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not, not um, yeah, well dated, but... <laughs> already around 1400, the Bohemian graduates start with a Kyriale. So it's mm -hmm. Hussites, it's not something that Hussites would introduce, it's the uh, the um uh, the outline of bohemian gradualers already in the 14th century uh -huh. interesting it, the munich Thank gradual you. from uh, around 1400 23286 has already kiriala at the beginning aha uh -huh. okay thank you okay. Uh, it was so, also a pressure a pressure characteristic okay I, I just found in the literature that it was typical of aesthetic but okay it's interesting to know that it was already a, a bohemian characteristic before thank you for this information Okay, sorry, I think uh, the time is passing and there are a few, a few more questions and then we have Julia, Julia's paper. Uh, so there was a question from Ellen concerning rests. So I think there are no notated rests. You used rests in your, in your transcription to find a solution for this. Uh, no, he, he already answered it before that okay. this was the only piece. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. He's the only one with a with a with a written uh, rest. And in the other in the other transcriptions, I showed it was in in um, yeah in in clamor, uh, and uh, yeah in, in square and square and uh, yeah. So that was a thing that it's perhaps better to sing it as an upbeat. But in in the in the two parts greater, of course, there must be rests, and they are written. Mm -hmm. And there's a question from Elena Meiorini. Uh, yeah, is there any reason for the name Cancionale since it doesn't contain any Cancio? I think yeah, this is I think not the case of this. Or, yeah. sorry. No, no, it was already the, this, this question was mm -hmm. already answered by Hanna Vlava Verna. Yeah, yes, this before. is a special, special kind of manuscripts. And the, the last question from Barbara Haig Iglo. Regarding the repeated melodies of the credo, do Hasite music theory treatises survive that discuss repetition or have credos as musical examples? So, Hannah, would you? We would love to have some treatises like this. I think. Do you know? No, <laughs> I would love to have it. Yes. <laughs> but these are nice ideas. Maybe we should look at. Nobody has looked at. Yes. Probably. 
Yeah. We, we maybe should say, and I don't, um, so not everybody realizes in the Czech, uh, in the Czech context, the medieval music was a forbidden topic for decades. Mm -hmm. So we are really the first generation starting it, uh, of, uh, so progressed first generation. So this is why so many, so many um, topics are just not covered. Yeah, and there is a suggestion from Barbara to falsify them. I think in the Czech culture, we have um, really, this is something we like to build a parallel histories or to false documents. So if we don't find any, we make them definitely. Yeah. So uh, thank you, thank you, David, and thank you thank for you. all questions. We are a little late, but I hope you. you're enjoying the possibility to to exchange ideas. And now we move to 